I want to share with you my journey with Christ, my story of my relationship with Christ, because this whole weekend is about building intimacy with Christ and building our lives around him, not just fitting him into our life, but learning what it really means to build our life, our lives around him. And some of you may have heard part of this story, but I'm going to kind of weave it in with some new aspects to the story. I remember I, I grew up in a Christian home and accepted Christ into my heart when I was about five years old and knew all the Bible verses, knew all the Awanas, you know, trivia, and really loved God as I was growing up. But I remember when I was about 11 years old, I remember feeling the pain of rejection. It wasn't from my family. It was actually just going to school, just going to my public school, sitting at a lunch table and listening to a boy tell me everything he didn't like about me. And I remember feeling so just devastated by that experience and so longing to find someone who would love me unconditionally, who would be a hero, who would never get annoyed with me, who would never... Um, be, get, become tired of me. Even though I had loving parents and I had a great family, I, I was longing for something even deeper than what human love could give. As I progressed through my later elementary years, I went through a lot of really hard things at school. I grew up in a world that was basically telling me I wasn't good enough, that I was worthless, that I was unattractive, that I was undesirable. And I remember the more I would hear those things, the more I would be made fun of or teased or ridiculed by my peers, the more it began to create this longing inside of me to find my knight in shining armor, my hero, the one who would just you know, find me beautiful and whisk me away into the sunset and help all of my dreams come true and be the ultimate rescuer, the ultimate gentleman. I didn't realize it at the time, but that was a longing in my heart for Jesus Christ, the ultimate hero, the ultimate gentleman, the ultimate rescuer. I didn't understand that. Jesus was just someone who had died to save me from my sins and keep me out of hell, and I esteemed him and even loved him, but I was still trying to meet those deeper needs in my heart some other way besides Jesus. And so I, as I got a little bit older, I learned how to play the game and be provocative in the way that I would dress and act around boys and try to get guys' attention. As I got into my middle school and high school years, I thought that if I could just find the right guy, I would be fulfilled. I would have that desire met for that hero, that rescuer. And I got into some different romantic relationships, got into some different flings with guys, gave my heart to one guy after the next, and realized, you know, I'm actually not finding what I'm searching for. And then I thought, well, maybe I can find it in popularity. If I have enough friends, if enough people like me, maybe I'll be fulfilled. Maybe that ache inside of me will finally go away, and I'll just, I won't feel so insecure about myself anymore. So I pursued popularity. I pursued large circles of friends and wanting to always make people like me, always say the right thing, always do the right thing. I built my life around these things for many years, the pursuit of guys, the pursuit of popularity, the pursuit of achievements and success, trying to fulfill a void that was in my heart, all the while calling myself a Christian, saying that I love Jesus Christ, going to church, going to youth group, even telling everyone that Jesus was the most important thing in my life. But I remember I was looking in the wrong places and I sort of began to realize that after a while. I was walking through a time when I was always feeling empty inside, and my heart was always being broken. Every time a guy broke up with me, I felt so devastated and like I had no worth, no value. And I was in a time of compromise and sin because the more I sought after popularity, the more I sought after fulfillment in these other things, the more I continued to compromise and allow sin into my life to somehow achieve that goal. I was walking in spiritual mediocrity, as it says in Titus 1.16, claiming to know God, but by my actions denying him. I was saying all the right things and going to church and doing the Christian thing, but Behind the scenes, my life was a completely different story. By my actions, I was denying Jesus Christ. I keep, 
I kept thinking about songs I shouldn't have listened to, words I shouldn't have spoken, movies I shouldn't have watched, friends I shouldn't have had, involvement with guys that I shouldn't have been participating in. That was the story of my life. One day I was taking a walk. I was about 16 years old and it was springtime. And I remember just walking and feeling, contemplating the emptiness of my life walking through this neighborhood that we lived in and just feeling like, God, you feel so distant. I go to church on Sunday and I talk about you and I sing about you, but I don't even know you. I, don't, I just kind of know you as a name and a few facts about you. I don't know you. I feel empty inside. I feel like I'm spiritually bankrupt. And on that walk, I felt the presence of God draw near to me in a very tangible way. And I began to realize, he began to speak to me about who he was. He wanted to be so much more than my savior. He wanted to be the Lord of my life. He wanted to be that hero, that rescuer, that knight in shining armor that I had always dreamed of. And I began to see the cross for the first time. I began to sort of awaken to the reality. Here I am searching for this knight in shining armor. I'm searching for this rescue out, this rescuer, this hero out there who would just love me unconditionally and be the perfect man, the perfect gentleman. And yet, here is Jesus who literally gave up his very life, left everything, his, his throne in heaven to come and spill out his life's blood to rescue me. We can't get any more of a hero than that. You can't find any greater of a rescuer than that. And I began to think about that and say, wow, this whole time I've been searching everywhere and he was right beside me all the time. The one that can fulfill me at the deepest level of my soul. Not a romantic fulfillment like, you know, some romantic weird thing of soul fulfillment that all the deepest needs and desires and longings of my heart, that perfect joy and satisfaction and peace that I had been desperately seeking could be found in him. I remember wondering if it was too late. Had I made too many mistakes? I'd been proclaiming to know God all of these years, and I had made a lot of mistakes. Behind the scenes, my life was not honoring to Jesus Christ. But I felt him draw near and say to me, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Don't just talk about me. Build your life around me. I don't want to just be your savior. I want to walk with you intimately through every day. I want to be your closest friend. I want to be your hero, your rescuer. I want to be the Lord of your life. That led me to go to my room and kneel down by my bed and lay my life on the altar before him and say, Lord, from now on, my life is yours. I'm not going to just talk about you. I'm going to give my life to you. Come and take over this life. Every precious thing in my life that I had clung to, my reputation, my popularity, my pursuit of guys, all of these things, laying them down at his feet and saying, Lord, nothing matters to me anymore but you. That was the reality that I lived in for so many years. Jesus became my everything, my all in all. He became my first love. He, I began to walk in the kind of peace and joy and fulfillment that the Bible talks about. I had happiness. I didn't have to be popular or have, cha have guys chasing after me. I had found everything that I needed in Jesus Christ. He was not just my savior. He became my everything, the center of my existence. I, instead of on Friday nights running out you know, to parties and and searching for guys, I began to spend time with him, getting to know him, worshiping, reading my Bible, studying Christian biographies, writing my journal. He, be, he drew near to me as I drew near to him. I remember listening to the crucifixion scene on my iPod one day, the audio Bible, and just meditating on that reality over and over and over again. I listened to it about five times of what he had done for me, what he had given up for me, how much he had loved me. And it just took my breath away. And I thought, if I could live in this reality, in the light of the cross, every single moment of every single day, it would change everything about my life. For many years, Jesus was the center. And even my love story with Eric was an outflow of my relationship with Jesus Christ. A lot of times people read our book, When God Writes Your Love Story, and, oh, I want that kind of fairy tale. It just sounds so fulfilling. It, 
it wasn't about what God did between us. It was about what God did in my heart towards Jesus Christ and what God did in his heart towards Jesus Christ. And our relationship together was just to enhance our individual relationships with Jesus Christ. And our love story began long before we ever even met each other with a much more important love story, the love story with Jesus Christ that each of us found individually. So we got married, and you'll have to read When God Writes Your Love Story to hear about all of that, and when dreams come true. I'm going to skip over that part of the story. It's too long. I'd be here all night if I shared it. But we were in full-time ministry, and it was a couple years into writing and speaking and traveling around the country and sharing about Jesus that all of a sudden, things in my life began to change. I had been so close to Jesus prior to going into ministry. And then I went into ministry, and I was, I was this ambassador for the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I didn't really feel like I knew him anymore. I began to let the cares of this life pull my gaze away from him. It was stressful being in ministry. People would criticize us, and people would hate us, and it was tiring and exhausting. And a lot of times after being sort of through the battleground of modern ministry, I would come home and instead of going to Jesus, sitting at his feet, reading his word, I would turn on the TV or I'd pop in a DVD or I would go to the internet and I began to be pulled into pop culture distractions. It's like, oh, I'm too tired to pray. I'm too tired to spend time in the, later, tomorrow. I, I can't spend time in the word. I'm, I'm so exhausted. I'm just battle weary. And so I began to turn to the things of the world for my fulfillment. And Jesus was no longer my all in all. And guess what? I no longer had peace and joy. I had walked in that for so many years, that triumph, that joy, that victory, that knowing God's presence with me so near every moment of the day. And now I was just sort of depressed and anxious all the time. And I didn't really even realize what had happened right away, but something had changed. Can you relate to this struggle? Wanting to keep Jesus as the center of your life, and yet... So many things pull you away from him. You know, the cross of Jesus Christ, living in light of what he has done for us, it should transform every area of our daily life. It should influence our every thought and decision. It should keep us captivated with him at all times. Why would we look for fulfillment elsewhere when we have the ultimate rescuer, the ultimate hero, right there waiting for us every moment of every day and yet from the moment we awake to the moment we fall asleep we are hit with countless distractions that cause our gaze to stray away from him there are distractions everywhere all around us and the sole purpose of them is to pull our gaze away from jesus christ now some of these things are amoral they're not bad in them themselves but they so quickly get out of control and become distractions just like Martha and Mary when Martha was serving and getting meals ready it wasn't bad that she was serving but she, it was bad that she was allowing those those cares and those details to pull her gaze away from the king of kings and the lord of lords who was sitting there right in her house and she was too busy and distracted to sit at his feet so we have cultural noise, we have phone calls, we have texts, we have Twitter, we have emails, we have Facebook, we have Pinterest, we have Instagram, we have movies, television, magazines, novels, advertisements, wants, materialism, entertainment, sports, hobbies, pleasures that we seek after. The world tells us you need to keep up with all that's happening in pop culture. Stay connected to your devices or you'll lose your popularity. Take a break, be entertained, you deserve it. Or you can't be spiritual all the time. You know, that's just not realistic. I actually heard that from a lot of Christian leaders. In this time when we were so burned out, I remember one weekend, Eric and I, we were so tired after a long week of ministry that we went away to some sort of cabin in the mountains. And we must have rented like 15 or 20 movies and did nothing but veg in front of movies for like three days straight. We were just zombies. And we just completely gave into that idea that, oh, well, we're too tired to be spiritual. It's just not realistic. The other day, it was a couple weeks ago, I was in the airport and just our flight was delayed. So we were looking, I was just people watching. Every single person, I mean, 96 to 99 percent of, of the two or 300 people that were around us in this airport waiting area were like this, or like this, or like this. I mean, nobody was talking, nobody was looking at each other, nobody was looking around. Everyone was like, you know, 
cell phones, iPads, iPods, computers. It, it was like, wow, it's like being in a sci-fi movie. I mean, we don't even live in the real world anymore. Like, everybody's life is in their device. I mean, it's pretty scary. But that's the culture that we live in. Distraction, distraction, distraction. Look here, look there, look at your device, play this game, watch this movie, text this person, read this Facebook post. It's everywhere. It's like a frenzy of cultural noise. And on top of that, we have personal pursuits. We have social activities, friendships, popularity, reputation, personal ambition and desires, romantic dreams and pursuits. And the world says, you won't be fulfilled until you have a large circle of friends. You won't be happy until you find the man of your dreams. You deserve to do whatever makes you happy. Follow your heart. Pursue your dreams. You deserve it. So we've got this message hitting us and that personal ambition that drives us, whatever it is. Some of us it's, that are single, it's marriage. Some of us that are um, married, it's having kids. Some of us, it's a career, it's a ministry, it's an opportunity, it's a, a certain amount of followers on Facebook. Whatever it is, it's that personal drive. This will fulfill me if I finally get this. And we have emotional and spiritual battles that hit us. Fears, worries, concerns, past failures, regrets, shame, enemy attacks and harassment. The enemy's lies are hitting us all the time. You don't have time for prayer and Bible study. Your life is too stressful, is what he tells us. God doesn't expect you to spend a certain amount of time and time with him. That's legalism, he tells us. You've made too many mistakes to have real intimacy with Christ. You're too depressed and anxious to spend time with Christ. You have special circumstances and issues in your life, and you just can't focus on him right now. You need to focus on your special circumstances and your issues. You can deal with Christ later. Where was God when you needed him? You have every right to pull away from him because he's let you down. Any of that sound familiar? So what's the solution to all this noise? Whether you're getting hit with cultural noise, personal noise, emotional noise, spiritual noise, what is the solution? I believe the answer is found in Psalm 86, 11. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. And that is the theme of our conference this weekend. Give me an undivided heart towards you, God. An undivided heart means united towards a singular purpose, fixed on a singular point, undistracted. What is the singular point that we need to fix our gaze upon? It's Jesus. The world will tell you it's all sorts of other things, but it's Jesus. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Lay aside those things and run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus is a verb, aferero, aferero, I'm terrible at the Greek pronunciation, it's something like that. But it's a verb, and it means to turn the eyes away from other things and to fix them on something. So we have to choose to turn our eyes away from all of these other things, to close our ears to all of these other voices and become fixed upon a singular point. It's an active activity. It's not a passive one. If we are passive, that noise, that distraction will take over our life and Jesus will be so blurred over we won't even be able to see him anymore. Fanny Crosby, she was one of the famous hymn writers from the 1800s. She was blind from infancy. And somebody told her when she was an adult, they said, oh, you've missed so much. You haven't gotten to see a sunset. You haven't gotten to see anyone's face. And she said, you don't understand. I have such a great advantage over you. Don't you realize the first face I'm going to see will be his? Can you imagine if we lived that way, if we lived with that passion, saying the greatest privilege of our life would be that the first face we would ever see would be his. You know, I've been in speaking and publishing and writing for a lot of years, and one thing that I know is that women, young women, uh, women of any age really, are the main purchasers of Christian materials, Christian music, Christian books, main attendees of Christian events, and I can't help but wonder what would happen if we as women truly got serious about our pursuit of Jesus Christ. If he became everything to us, if we had that undivided heart, that singular focus on him. Because a lot of times, 
people will write books and produce music and produce events for the modern church based on what they think that we as women want, because it's what sells. And what they think that we as women want is basically just how do you um, decorate your house and how do you find the right guy and how do you deal with the cares of this life and kind of blend Jesus into that. And so you have a load of material that is coming into the church that is a watered down gospel where Jesus is kind of blurred over in the middle of all of this temporal stuff. And it's affecting the church as a whole because that's so much of the material that's coming in is geared for us as women. And I've actually been in meetings where I've heard publishers say, well, women can't really handle deep spiritual truth. Their lives are too stressful and busy and chaotic. They just need easy, bite-sized, gentle truths. They can't handle, you know, a complete full devotional or, an, a, you know, a very challenging gospel message that just points them to Jesus Christ. You know, they're too busy and they have so many issues. They just can't. And so... It's what's feeding into the church, shallow fluff, because that's what they think we want. What if we got serious? What if we fixed our eyes upon Jesus? How would the modern church change? Not that men have nothing to do with it, but as far as looking at Christian media and material and books, so much of it is geared for us as women, and so much of it is geared in a shallow way because we are living shallow lives. The fruit of distraction is a barren heart. If you are passive about these distractions in your life and you let them control you and pull your gaze away from Jesus, they will lead you to a barren heart and an empty spiritual life. And maybe that's where some of you are this weekend. In Luke 8, 5, it says, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. These are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked just listen to this list, with worries and riches and pleasures of this life. That sounds to me a lot like American femininity. Worries and riches and pleasures of this life. We are consumed with worries about ourselves. We are concerned with our comforts and our own material possessions. We are concerned with and consumed with pleasures and entertainment and having fun. And what happens? We bring no spiritual fruit to maturity when we let those distractions take over our life. So getting back to my story, dealing with my distractions, I went through a season where God had to show me how divided my heart was from Jesus Christ. I still believed all the same things. But as I looked at my life, I began to realize, okay, God, I'm starting to feel distant from you again. I don't know where you are. I talk about you. I lead people to you, but I don't know, I, I don't know you anymore. I feel far away from you. Why? And he began to show me my life. And I had to be completely honest and say, yes, Lord, it's true. I would rather spend a night in front of the TV than a night on my knees in prayer before you. I would rather surf the internet for fashion trends than search your word for priceless nuggets of truth. If I have a choice between a Grisham novel or shallow romance, Christian romance novel, or a a Christian biography that would literally challenge me to a deeper commitment to you, I will choose the novel, hands down. I had lost my spiritual hunger. My heart had turned aside to other lovers, other idols, other gods besides the one true God. I was honoring God with my words, but not with my life. As it says in Mark 7, 6, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In my new book, The Set Apart Woman, and if you were here last year, I shared this story, but I remember being in a speaking event. Eric and I were sitting in the, in the green room behind the stage waiting to go out on stage, and there was a worship team back there and, and the pastor and just a bunch of the leaders that were part of the ministry team. And they were talking and joking about Saturday Night Live and telling all these cr- crude jokes that they had seen on the show the night before. They were talking about some new Hollywood blockbuster. Somebody was talking about their new Xbox. Somebody was talking about a playoff game they had been to. And they were just completely reveling in these worldly, trivial, and sometimes ungodly things. This was like five minutes before the service was supposed to start. And then they just kept going and going and going on that vein. And then somebody said, oh guys, you know, we're starting, we're going to be on stage in a minute, let's pray. And they all like, like a light bulb stopped talking about their trivial things and prayed this 
God be glorified. Then they go out on stage and they are just, you know, like worshiping. They're singing that God is their all in all. And I remember being behind the, the scenes thinking, how can they do that? How can they go straight from just delighting in the things of this world to being in the presence of God and saying that he's their everything? And as I began to be disturbed by this, a voice of conviction, the Spirit of God, began to speak to my heart and say, your discomfort isn't just what you're seeing in them because the same compromises in your life. Look at how you spend your free time. Look at where you turn when you're exhausted and you just want comfort and you want pleasure. You're not going to your knees. You're not going to my word. You're not going to the foot of, to, to the feet of Jesus. You are going to the TV and the, the computer and anywhere but me. And I began to realize, wow, I am guilty of the same hypocrisy. I mean, mine, I was a little more hidden in my hypocrisy, but I was living the exact same compromise. And God was saying to me, you have left your first love. You have lost your spiritual passion. You've become apathetic towards me. Now, there are people today that will tell you that passion towards God, being constantly excited about God and passionate about God at all times is not possible. In fact, there are entire books written telling you that you shouldn't feel bad. That's just normal. The Christian life is just sort of a mediocre set of, you know, emotional blips and then lows and depression and um, just kind of, you know, muddling your way through. And that's okay. That's okay because God loves you anyway. These are the books that are coming out today. These are the messages that are coming out today. They're saying you can't have passion all the time for Christ. That's not possible. Well, how come we have passion for the things of this world all the time? Our favorite movies, our favorite movie stars, our favorite sports team, our favorite drama on Facebook. We have passion for those things. But we can't have passion for Jesus Christ at all times. Romans 12, 11 says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Never be lacking in zeal. Spiritual fervor is not an emotional high. When people say, oh, you know, you'll exhaust yourself if you try to maintain that spiritual passion. Well, yeah, if you're trying to maintain an emotional high, you will. But it's not, it's not that. It's a gaze that is constantly fixed upon Jesus, a heart that is constantly on fire for him. And that is the Christian life. It is more than possible. It is what he's called us to. So many of us struggle with feeling distant from God. In fact, as I have ministered to young women or women of, of really all ages, one of the number one things that I get, that I hear from women, is that I feel distant from God. He feels far away, and I don't know how to get close to him. We often think that closeness, of God, closeness to God is just a matter of chance. It's like if God happens to be in a good mood, he'll reveal himself to me. But actually, closeness to God is based upon the condition of our heart. That's what it's based on. That's why James 4, uh, James says uh, in four, James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Purify your heart, you double-minded. When you purify your heart and you're not double-minded, but you're single-minded, you're fixing your gaze on Jesus and you're drawing near to him, he will draw near to you. If you have an undivided heart towards him, you will know him, you will walk with him, you will feel close to him, you will feel his presence in your life. Eric and I went through a season where we realized both, both of us had become very spiritually dry. Our gaze had strayed away from Jesus, and he was kind of blurred over with all the cares of this life and all the pop culture distractions that we had gone allowed in. And he had to take us through an awakening, a season of revival, of, of, of regaining our passion for Jesus Christ. Because, you know, this problem that we both had of, of feeling like we had distanced ourselves from God it couldn't be solved by forcing ourselves to spend more time in his presence. Just like, okay, I'm going to go through the motions. I'm going to read my Bible for an hour a day. I'm going to pray. I'm going to do all this stuff, and I'm just going to work up some spiritual passion. It can't be regained that way. Actually, the only thing that we can do to regain our spiritual passion is to remove all distractions, fix our gaze upon him, and go after him with an undivided heart. And that was what he began to call us to do. It wasn't a matter of going through and putting a bunch of rules on ourselves, but to say, Jesus, we're, saying, we're deliberately choosing to tune out all of this noise and all of these distractions and fix our gaze upon you and run after you once again. And as we began to draw near to him, he began to draw near to us. Some of the practical things that we did in that time is we replaced our trivial 
activities with prayer. Instead of having a movie fest on a Friday night, we would have a time of prayer. Instead of dialing around on the TV when we were depressed or anxious, we would go to the Word of God. We begin to say, let's replace trivial, meaningless activities with activities that actually draw us closer to Jesus Christ. It's a novel concept. I mean, brilliant. But it was brilliant. It really was. It seems so simple, but it was what allowed us to say, to say no to all this noise, say yes to him. We begin to look to him as our source of comfort. You know, in Psalm 1611, it says, in your presence is the fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. But most of us don't believe that's true. We think that in front of a movie is the fullness of joy, or in front of our computer is the pleasures forevermore, or, you know, hanging out with our friends or going to a party or, you know, meeting, uh, if we're single, you know, an available guy who's attractive, that's the fullness of joy, you know, that's pleasures forevermore. Jesus says he is the fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Are we willing to allow him to prove that true in our lives? So Eric and I went through a season where he said, okay, Lord, we're going to stand on that promise in your word. And we're going to say no to all these distractions, say yes to you. And guess what? We found the fullness of joy. Now, I won't say it was easy. A Friday night would roll around and we'd want to go get a DVD and a big thing of popcorn and just veg. But then we'd hear that still small voice saying, come into my presence. You will, you will find the fullness of joy. And as we began to replace trivial activities for eternally focused activities, we began to find a joy and a peace that could not be matched by Hollywood. It could not be matched. I remember there was some team, was, was it the Rockies? It was a World Series was going on. And, and God um, challenged Eric, you know, don't find your joy in the World Series. I'll give you a spiritual world series if you focus on me and that's exactly what happened and it was just like that other stuff just felt so meaningless and trivial when we began to experience the real thing everything else felt like a counterfeit when we began to come into the presence of god and experience true joy and true peace we had to deliberately choose to tune out the enemy's lies and the noise of the culture and tune into jesus and we began to find strength for the battle that we were called to fight. Instead of just limping around and just being exhausted after going through these spiritual battles and being in ministry, we began to find real spiritual strength for the battle that we were called to fight. That season changed our life. Now, I won't say that we've never had a, a problem with keeping our gaze fixed upon Christ. In fact, it's a daily decision. It's a daily choice to say, I'm tuning this out so I can fix my gaze upon you because we live in a battleground. And the noise is so loud. The distractions are so many. I mean, you don't have to do anything but wake up, and your phone is blinking. Your computer is making noise. You're, there is noise everywhere. You walk out your door. There is noise, noise, noise. I mean, even if you had no devices in your life whatsoever, you would still hear the, the noise of the enemy trying to pull you away from Christ. And so it's a deliberate choice to say, I'm saying no to all that, to say yes to him, and to be proactive in doing it. As it says in Hebrews 12, to turn the gaze away from everything else and fix it on one thing, looking unto Jesus. Is your heart divided from Christ? Is the gaze of your soul steadfastly fixed upon him, or is it pulled in a hundred different directions? We're going to look really quick at what it means, what it looks like, to have an undivided heart, because maybe you don't know. Maybe you're wondering. It's like, well, I love Jesus. I have a relationship with him. How do I know if I have an undivided heart? When you have an undivided heart, and like I said, th these are not areas that I have arrived in, or it's like, oh, I'm totally walking in this every moment of every day. This is the journey that I'm on, the desires that God has placed in my heart, and the goal, the, the prize that I have my eyes fixed upon is what I'm pursuing by his grace. It's not something I'm trying to tout myself as I've arrived here. But this is, this is where our goal needs to be. This is where our focus needs to be. When you have an undivided heart, your greatest desire is to spend and be spent for his glory. That's what you desire. You're not pursuing personal ambition. You desire to pour out your life for the glory of God. That becomes the burning cry of your heart. I recently reread the book uh, Through Gates of Splendor, which is about those missionaries, the, the five young men who gave their lives as martyrs to um, 
bring the gospel to unreached tribes in Ecuador in 1956. And Jim Elliott was one of them. Nate Saint was one of them. But one of them was a man named Ed McCauley. And his, his story is so interesting because you don't hear that much about him. But in the book, she details how he, when he was a young man, he had to make a decision uh, before he ever went to the mission field.